Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Ivan Sokal, and I will guide you through the plenary session of our conference. Therefore, let me introduce you our conference chairman, Petra Marešová. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, I welcome you at the Hradec Economics Days conference. I am pleased to see this year again international participants, colleague from, colleagues from Czech universities, business, also participants from the summer school from, from Spain and Slovakia. I welcome here also colleagues from cooperation institutions, Wroclaw University of Economics, University of Pardubice, the University of South Bohemia Technology Transfer Office and Charles University Innovation Prague. Thank you also all speakers who have accepted an invitation to participate in our program and come us sometimes from a long distance, for example, University of Technology Malaysia. This year we are opening new decade, 21st year of conference, and I am proud to introduce you to <coughs> event. Firstly, we organize with University of Pardubice and Project Management Association and special track and panel discussion today uh, dedicated to uh, project management today at half past three. Secondly, we organize special guest speech today at four o'clock in this room. Jaromír Zahrádka, founder of Technology Transfer Fund, who focuses on investment in Central European scientific startups, will have a lecture about market potential of early stage technologies and spin-off valuation. To keep your mind fresh before this lecture, uh, you can visit coffee tasting event in the first floor of this building, also from half past three. And finally, tomorrow, I warmly invite you to tomorrow's discussion session from 9 o'clock also here. We prepared networking session for those seeking project and academia business cooperation opportunities. We did our best to prepare an interesting program for all of you. And I believe and hope that your participation here brings you inspiration for your future work. Many thanks go to organization team and also management of this faculty who consistently support this event. I would like to introduce you also the Dean of the Faculty of Informatics and Management, management Professor Josef Hinek. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you at the Faculty of Informatics and Management of the University of Hradec Králové at the occasion of Hradec Králové Economic Days. I must say that recently I have met a lot of people who told me that they are afraid that we are living during some very dark and unoptimistic, unoptimistic times. Of course, the Consumer prices are unbelievably high, inflation has skyrocketed, and the state of the public finance is everything but sound. Some people say it's tragic. And on the top of it, our government is still discussing what to do in this situation and promising they will tell us in a month or two. On the other hand, I think from the point of economist, we are living during the time when the customer prices are unbelievable, unbelievably high. The inflation has skyrocketed and the state of the public finance is everything but sound. I think it must be a very exciting time for everyone who is interested in economy, in finance, public finance or public policy. So I believe that not only because of this, but based on this, 
you will have a very interesting and deep discussions during those two days here. I hope you will enjoy your time in Hradec Králové and I wish you very inspirational Hradec Králové Economic Days conference. Once again, welcome to our university and enjoy our conference. Thank you very much. terrible weather, we're lucky we can spend it right here. And now it is time that we welcome our first keynote speaker who represents Czech Banking Association and will deliver his presentation on the matter of Czech economic outlook. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jakub Seidler. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for invitation. I will devote my time uh, to a uh, relatively hot topic of inflation, which was already mentioned here, uh, that it's basically a topic which is now very actual. And uh, I will link it a little bit to global data and maybe we can think what was the reason behind the current uh, inflation, which is uh, uh, highest in a few decades, not only in the Czech Republic, but uh, basically everywhere. So uh, when we look at inflation, hopefully you can see the data and I will maybe move a little bit here. I can see it also. Uh, we can see that uh, inflation became some global phenomenon, not only in the Czech Republic, but generally globally. So you can look at the year on year growth in, in, in prices in the uh, other regions, European Union, US, and you might see that uh, the figures we are now seeing are the highest in the last couple of decades. Uh, and basically it's uh, also true for OECD average. So basically inflation, as we observe it right now, is some kind of global phenomenon, not only the case we are solving in the Czech Republic or in the C region or in the European Union. And when we look a little bit into details, uh, luckily we are not uh, here as, for example, Argentina with inflation above 100%. And we also see that the usual suspect was Turkey in last year with inflation uh, around 80%. But these are official figures and some estimates are showing that uh, this figure could be even higher. Uh, but you might see that double digit inflation generally was the case for many advanced countries and um, this is something what uh, we are seeing everywhere right now. And I wanted to speak a little bit, maybe a little bit controversially, what, what is the main factor behind. Of course, the main story is clear. It was energy crisis, it was war uh, in the Ukraine, which basically made the energy crisis more intense and it was for sure COVID and how it uh, disrupted the supply chains between companies. Basically, something what was built up for decades by companies, how to deliver goods from one part of the world to other part, which should be the most cheapest and, and fastest. Everything this break up, this, this engine break up. So it's clear that this supply chain disruption had a significant uh, implications for that. But, uh, but still, when we are looking at that from a little bit broader picture, and we have to always think about the famous word that inflation is always about the money, we have to think, okay, so if one items were growing higher, so if there would not be sufficient amount of money in the Czech economy, or in the global economy, sorry, then other items should be going down. So basically, we do not see that. We see that the inflation is basically increasing for, for most of the items. And we have to therefore think whether we could, could not find a little bit different reasons than only, which is the most common one, energy and, and supply chain after COVID. And one of the reasons could be very eased monetary policy of the global central banks after the global financial crisis. You can see here interest rates of the main global central banks. 
after a global financial crisis, when every central bank need to solve imminent trouble in the economy and push interest rate to very low levels. But unfortunately, very low interest rate remained in the economy for more than a decade, even if the economic situation probably does not deserve or needed that. And we, we get to some relatively crazy situation when uh, central bank policy became to some extent relatively asymmetric. So if there was any, any uncertainty in the economy, central bank were always happy and willing to support economy by east or uh, lower interest rate or more east monetary policy. And their willingness to tight monetary policy was relatively, relatively uh, limited. So we got to the situation when we faced very, very low interest rate uh, for more than decades. And basically, this chart for me, when I saw it for the first time, was uh, absolutely mind-breaking. And this is showing the amount of quantitative easing by the main central banks uh, uh, since the global financial crisis and in the COVID times. So since the financial crisis, interest rates get to zero and central banks needed to support economy even a little bit more. So they introduced so-called quantitative easing, which broadly means that they are buying bonds into their balance sheets to further, let's say, provide liquidity to the banking sector and made monetary policy a little bit more eased in the situation when interest rates were at zero, so they could not be uh, even more lowered. And because they needed to support the economy for the whole decade, the quantitative easing somehow continued. Here it started in the US, then it was more supported by ECB, but, but, but this was in my view, very important point, beginning of the COVID. So central bank needed support economy so much in this very uncertain time of pandemic. And with interest rate generally still being very low, the, the amount of quantitative easing, just which was provided during first couple of months during pandemic was even higher than during years during global financial crisis. So basically, this could be one of the basically reasoning. It's, of course, it doesn't mean that central bank are printing money. The money remains between central bank and banks, but it definitely allows the banking sector to more easily provide credit. Some investor could get of this crisis without losses, so they can easily then use the money for other investments. And it definitely means that uh, monetary policy in last decade was super east and during the COVID it even intensified to quite significant level. As such, central bank balance sheets during this time significantly increased and also globally. So we might see that central banks balance sheets went significantly higher in last decade and it was also the true for the Czech central bank which did not do quantitative easing but they did FX flow regime which is very, let's say, similar kind of uh, regime, meaning in terms of increasing balance sheets and increasing link liquidity in the banking sector. So these were central banks. But what also ha happened in the COVID was very strong reaction of the fiscal policy. Central bank during the COVID had, uh, let's say, idea that um, they need to support economy because usually fiscal policy government cannot do it quickly enough. So monetary policy is fast, fiscal policy takes some time. But during the pandemic and during all the huge pressure and the situation was really unclear at the beginning, even the fiscal policy started to be super fast. And we can look at the total in-depthness of the most countries which increased significantly during the beginning of the pandemic. And the global indebtedness increased by more than 20 percentage points. So again, fiscal policy became much more east, much more supportive together to very east monetary policy. And as I mentioned, 
Inflation is always about the money, and economists are trying to measure money by many ways. Uh, it's much more complicated uh, due, to, due to different alternative assets, but still we are looking at so-called uh, monetary aggregates, and this is showing what happened. And most nicely visible example are United States, when dynamic of M2, so basically the money in the economy increase by almost 30% in the United States. So incredible growth of the, of the money uh, in the US. And we saw some acceleration. It's not so nicely visible in, the, in this chart because US are a little bit outlier. But even in the Eurozone and in the Czech Republic, the money to aggregates were growing by double digit pace. Here in the Czech Republic, some detail. Usually money are linked to the credit. This, this is, uh, this is uh, connected. So if the credit in the economy is growing, it should be reflected in growth in the money. But here we see some difference between credit growth and M2 and M3 aggregate. What was the reason behind? It was a huge issuance of the government bonds by the Czech government. Because if they are issuing government bonds, this is basically only credit, which is transmitted in this different way, and the money issued by the government immediately get to the economy, to the accounts of companies and households because they were supported during COVID and that's why it increased significantly also the M2 and M3 aggregates. So we are going back a little bit to my first question whether the current inflationary phenomenon is really only linked to the energy crisis and to supply chain disruptions. Because now, given all this issue, it little bit seems that the inflationary factors were already gradually built up in last more than decades due to very easy monetary policy and then even accelerated during COVID. And very likely, factor of supply chain disruptions and factor of Ukraine and energy crisis was some kind of catalyst which used the inflationary pressures to accelerate more and quickly, but very likely we would see inflation anyhow, definitely not so fastly and maybe not so broadly, but, but the inflationary, let's say, background was already set very likely by the policy, not only by central banks, but also fiscal policy as a combination of last uh, factors in last uh, more than decades, starting from global financial crisis. So this was uh, maybe some kind of uh, broader, uh, broader reasoning why we are seeing what we are seeing in, in our inflationary figures and uh, why we are fighting with inflation now relatively globally. When I get to the Czech Central Bank or Czech, Czech case, uh, our inflation is also one of the highest in last three decades. Uh, this 20% was definitely linked also to the transformation of the Czech economy. So prices were growing for many different reasons here at the beginning of the 90s. But definitely the price growth is absolutely uh, unbelievable and really hardly anyone could imagine that we will face double-digit inflation so quickly uh, when we discuss the situation, for example, two, two and a half year back. So inflation, double-digit in the Czech economy, and um, today we, we got the release, inflation in year-on-year -year terms declined to 15%, but from 16.7 to 15, almost half of the decline was driven only by full prices because you might see that oil prices is now going down so that's why full prices declined contributed by minus 0.7 percentage points to euro inflation so basically part of the decline is given only by oil prices which is very volatile and in next <coughs> month or two uh, it could be even even higher just uh, just maybe <laughs> Uh, this is for someone who, who likes tables and, and uh, figures, but I just wanted to look how price of or growth of prices looks like in last two years. And we see that prices in last two years increased by 
So this is, uh, this is even uh, more uh, worrying for uh, people who save some money. And what were the main factor behind that? Not only energy, so electricity heating, it increased by 80%, but if we take into account also the weight of this item in the consumer basket, the contribution was the second highest, but the, the most important factor was food prices, which increased by 33% in last two years. But given the high weight in our consumer basket, it was the highest item pushing prices or inflation uh, above in, in, last, in last two years. But of course, there are a lot of, you might see that the price growth was relatively broad based. We could see that also prices in restaurants growing, so services, imputed rent, which is item uh, linking the property prices grow. So the, the price grow was, was really broad based. And, and here is just all, all maybe uh, uh, just for your curiosity, which items were growing most. So basically not looking at, at the, the weight of the particular item, but just on the item itself. And um, so usual suspects here, sugar, uh, eggs, so all, all these uh, items which you, which you can uh, very often hear, hear about uh, in, in the media. So this is just uh, for your information that many, many of those items basically were growing uh, more than 100% in last two years and many of them more than 50%. So, so price growth was uh, really, really uh, strong. Even when we, when we distinguish the price basket to different categories, you might see that the price growth was relatively, relatively strong. And what is now relatively no, not so favorable that year-on-year -year inflation is going down, but to the large extent because of the high base effect. You are comparing the year on year figure with already relatively high prices year, year ago. So that's why we will see a decline in year on year prices, so in inflation measured as a year on year grow. But together, many other items are still growing. And even those who are which are declining might be still growing in month on month terms. So it is still visible that the, the total inflationary pressure remains in the economy relatively high. And that's why it seems right now that even this year, we will experience double digit inflation uh, for the whole year. So while last year inflation on average was around 15%, now it should be around 11%. And we will be happy if we will get with inflation below 10% uh, in mid, mid year. What did Czech Central Bank? Central Bank um, increased interest rate relatively fastly. It was among the first central bank who started to, to hike interest rate, despite the fact that at that time we still had uncertainty with COVID pandemic. And at that time, many economists believed that all these inflationary pressures are only temporary. So they did a relatively good job. Then they decided to stop at 7%. And because of uncertainty on the market at the time, also related to Ukraine crisis, the corona started to depreciate strongly and Czech Central Bank decided to use a fixed reserve to support corona, not to leave it depreciate strongly. And they used a relatively huge amount of money, 26 billion euro, but they have a huge FX reserve uh, after the FX flow regime from 2013-2017. So they used combination of those factors and you might see that high interest rate definitely plays a role in, in the economy. Here is, for example, volume of newly provided mortgages, which declined by absolutely stunning pace. And the number of newly provided mortgages per month right now is the lowest in the last 20 years. So definitely higher interest rate had the effect to credit provided to households, especially mortgages. But for example, yeah, in consumer lending, you might see that the change of newly provided credit, consumer credit did not decline so significantly. So consumer credit 
did not react so, so as, as, as mortgage market. And what we see in the corporate, corporate segment is that many companies are now substituting towards euro-denominated loans. So basically when they see that they can get euro loans for on average 4%, they rather take it because Czech loan would be costly, much more costly, 9% and more, for example. So the share of FX denominated loan is getting higher and is approaching almost to 50%. So corporate segment is now, let's say naturally, uh, shifting towards euro, euro loans. So it, it shows that the situation even in Czech economy is, is not very so, so, so easy how, how to solve that this situation. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, inflation is a global phenomenon and we need the global central banks to fight with inflation, which luckily is now happening. And we as a small open economy, it would be for the Czech Central Bank very difficult to fight with the global inflationary pressure. Even if they would push interest rate above 10%, I have really doubt that it would really help to tame inflation much more, uh, much more strongly. Of course, Corona could be a little bit stronger, but still the, the strength of the FX pass-through is very often overestimated in my view in this discussion, because before the uh, before COVID pandemic, we usually estimated so-called FX pass-through, which means that how much inflation is going down if Corona appreciate by some percentage point. And it was estimated around 15%. So it means that Corona, if uh, appreciate by 10%, it would decline year on in inflation by 1.5 percentage points. So almost nothing given the double digit inflation. Now the FX path through could be a little bit stronger. It could be 30% because we are now more linked to the energy and energy plays a higher role. But even if the FX path through is 30-40%, still 10% appreciation of the corona could lower year on in inflation, for example, by 3-4 percentage points and we are still having double digit inflation. So basically, Corona definitely has a positive role. If it's stronger, it's lowering inflation, but it's uh, not very reasonable to believe that we could fight this inflation only with Corona, because if, even if the Czech Central Bank would be using FX reserve and pushing Corona to even stronger levels, it would really need to be super strong to, uh, to reasonably tame current level of inflation, but of course such a strong corona would be uh, absolutely huge damage for the export, uh, export oriented uh, economy. So uh, not, not easy decision. So this was, uh, this was uh, just a short summary how the situation looks like and I uh, intentionally uh, leave, uh, leave the presentation with some unanswered questions and hope that we will, we will have some debate. And uh, also what I would like to maybe mention at the end of the discussion, if you are interested in, in Czech data, look at CBI Monitor. We are now providing um, uh, different data from the Czech economy and also about the property markets, for example, uh, for different regions. So this can also help you maybe to orientate uh, in, the, in the current uh, not easy understandable world of what is going on in the Czech economy. So thank you, thank you very much for attention. This was some kickoff, uh, maybe, or, or I hope that it was some kickoff for potential potential discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, and now there's a time for questions from the audience. So please. Uh, you can ask uh, by raising a hand, we can give you our question microphone, or if uh, your voice is sound enough, you can try it without it, please. The audience seems a bit shy today, so the first question will go from me. And in the meantime, you have a time for your questions, if you think about them. Well, uh, double-digit inflation is something uh, we are not used to, or we were not used to. 
The problem is uh, not just how deeply rooted inflation expectations are in minds of consumers, but also in minds of producers. So what is uh, your opinion on a situation where maybe commodity and energy inflation pressures will be dealt with, but this mindset, inflationary mindset remains. How long it will take for us to let inflation go in our mindset? Yeah, this is um, yeah, I'm not, not the easiest question, uh, uh, question at the beginning, because now the inflationary expectation is the most important what should be the further reaction of the central bank. But unfortunately, we cannot measure that. Yeah. Czech Central Bank measure it by some questionnaires among companies. And they had similar questionnaire among households. But among households, it was so volatile, so they stopped doing it because the value added was very low. And they basically have very difficult to measure ex inflationary expectation. And this is now absolutely crucial where a central bank should fight against inflationary expectations or now should be on the hold because they know that the base effect and the lower demand and lower commodity prices will uh, the, the situation solve uh, a little bit. And um, I must say that inflationary expectation is very tricky thing, but I still believe that the proper measure or proper way of measure inflationary expectation is based on your really money decision which you are doing. Not asking companies what your expectations about inflation in three years, or not asking financial experts what your inflationary expectation in the next two, three years. But you need to measure it by how you are really behaving by your money, whether you are making really bets when your money is involved. So example of proper way of measuring inflationary expectations are mortgages. If households would be persuaded that inflation will remain double digit in the ne next five years, definitely mortgage with seven year or six six percent rate would be still good deal. But we still see that this is not the case. And also we see that households are still preferring fixation of the mortgages a little bit shorter, meaning that they still believe that inflation is short-term period. That's why they prefer shorter fixation because they hope that in three years after refixation they will be able to refix it for uh, lower interest rate. So, so that's why I, I believe and unfortunately it's not easy that we should measure inflation or expectation based on this real money decision and not only by questionnaires among companies because in the questionnaires we saw different inconsistencies. For example, they were asking companies about expectations about the uh, prices in next three years, and they had more than 7%. But in the same questionnaire, they were asking about wage growth, expected wage growth in next year, and companies were saying just 5%. So it was inconsistent. If company would be expecting 7% inflation for next few years, definitely they should be expecting also higher wage growth in, in, in this kind of period. So, so questionnaires are basically only questionnaires, and inflationary pressure, inflation expectation should be measured by really your money decisions, which unfortunately, but maybe f good research topic uh, for university, because this is now black box and we really do not know. And unfortunately, this is a crucial for, uh, for proper central bank policy reaction. Thank you very much. There was some optimism uh, in the answer. Uh, just to uh, make it a little more accurate, I would like to ask, so the most common type of mortgage fixation is two or three years now? Three, three, five, three, uh, five. Three, three or five years. We, unfortunately, we do not have proper data from the Czech Central Bank. We have only buckets. So we have bucket one, three, three, uh, five, uh, five, uh, ten. But definitely uh, now compared to two years period, it, it is moving from bucket five, ten to three, five. Thank you. Thank you very much. And well, there are two questions. Uh, would like a microphone or you would like to? Yeah, I can ask. Yeah, please. Uh, inflation expectations uh, when it comes to the strengthening of the Chinese and Indian currencies uh, and trading with that, because I see that Russia wants to trade with Chinese currencies, uh, so do other nations. 
will that also weaken the dollar and, and therefore uh, increase uh, future inflation globally? Oh. The correlations. To be honest, I cannot answer it now properly because I'm not sure uh, what it will make also with the global demand. So I believe that yeah, a lot of commodities are related to dollar, but still I believe that much uh, higher role will have global demand than uh, maybe fluctuation in, in the euro U or USD payer because it's very often changing. So I'm not sure I can properly, properly answer. The good question, but not easy answer, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we will continue it. Okay, colega. Uh, he so hard questions are continuing. Uh, can I ask you when we, when we compare this inflation of the zone maybe the, the, the last century, so 40s or 80s or shocks, the main difference today is that cumulative deaths are so huge. So many argue that basically you cannot use high interest rates for a long time because you are running time and this is running against time uh, mainly okay you are speaking about mortgages but but company company bonds when they need to roll over uh, there is there is no there are no fears that in the second half of the year we can expect credit or liquidity or liquidity even and so one example for all uh, maybe from, from the real estate sector, uh, Germany and European biggest street, real estate investment trust is Volovia, and its market value declined to one third of value of underlying real estate. So what do you think about this? Will, will be inflation entrenched because, uh, because central banks will be forced to, to lower the rates after, let's say, one year or yeah, to be honest, the comparison with 80s for me is not uh, generally, I do not like it so much because the world is absolutely different compared to 80s. The ability of, um, of consumers to compare prices across the market is much higher, so, so possibility of companies to keep prices higher, keep margins higher, is in current online world much more difficult than it was the 80s and also the global, global chains of companies is much more different. So I think there are reasons behind why the current situation is really different compared to, to 80s from perspective of anti-inflationary reasons why we should not stick with this inflation so long. On the other hand, when we got to double digit inflation, what is bad is that it's disturbing the relative prices. So now it's much more easier for many companies to increase the price because they say, okay, everybody is increasing, maybe the cons consumer will not uh, noted it and they will accept it. So basically it is also destroying the relative prices. Uh, so, so this could be danger, but related to a huge indebtedness, of course, th th this is the issue. This is uh, one of the reasons why we probably have some, not only lower bound of the interest rate, but also some kind of upper bound of the interest rates. That's very likely true. I think that nobody cannot estimate what is the upper bound of the interest rate. Maybe the event which happened in the banking sector in the US are, is showing that there will definitely be upper bound and we might not be away from that. Uh, but um, on the other hand, uh, unfortunately, I believe that uh, some negative scenarios and some bankruptcies, etc., will need to happen. And th this is part of the cleaning process of the economy. And if we will stay in the, uh, in the mind that uh, we cannot leave any potential losses happen in the economy and we will try to solve something, Sooner or later, it will not be now, maybe it will be in the decade or two or three, it, it cannot be sustainable forever. Yeah? So, so I believe that some losses is a natural way how to, to deal with the inflation. But of course, you need as a policymaker always be careful where the losses are acceptable and when it basically making uh, economy really, really falling apart. And this is, of course, very difficult to, to judge. So I'm really happy that uh, I do not need to do this decision. Yeah. Thank you. I see the debate is heating up. So <laughs> please. No, yeah, these are tough questions. So. <laughs> no, <that's good. laughs> Inflation, 
communicating more about inflation impacts expectation, which again impacts economy. So what do you think about Because I know that actually some governments are kind of holding back on the inflation because they don't want the consumers to kind of increase their inflation expectations. If you know you, you know what I'm talking about. So what are your thoughts on that? Like how can we kind of navigate this? Because this communication is also impacting the expectations and the behavior of mm -hmm. the market, which is actually making it worse. So so uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, did, yeah did, <laughs> did, did, this is always quite a difficult and that's why um, for example, Central Bank is one of the institutions which is basically legally allowed to lie a little bit because they need to form uh, inflationary expectations. So that's why they always need to say we are approaching to the target because yeah. this is forming the inflationary expectations and this is their, this is their job. Yeah? So from this perspective, uh, it's, it's clear. Uh, and of course, this, 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 is, this, is tough, this is tough topic, and I think there is a huge research on the topic of inflationary expectations. And it's quite an amazing discussion because they are um, having a lot of um, empirical research how inflationary expectations are, are built in, a, in, in the society among households. And it's quite a funny because uh, then they realize that uh, men and women have different inflationary expectations because usually women are making sh grocery shopping. And, and despite all difficulties in, um, uh, in monetary policy and how technical issue it is and how they tr try to form inflationary expectations, the most important factor is food prices, right. basically, which is absolutely irrelevant for the monetary policy. So, so th there are a lot of tricky issues uh, how to tackle that, and it's definitely not easy. And also, remember one f funny, funny statement that they did research among US people and asking, uh, what is fat, and more than 50% answer is that they believe that there's some company for delivery services. Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so get proper monetary policy argumentation to general public is definitely very difficult. Yeah? It's, it's for sure very difficult. It's crucial, but it's difficult. And also, uh, yeah, dif difficult, difficult answer. I, I said that it will be a difficult question, and uh, I, I have, I have no answer, unfortunately. But it's important, definitely. No worries. What are we doing today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last question from the audience, please. Uh, I wish to ask you like two connected questions that from your presentation and from other signals from Czech economy or global economy, I see some trends, so I would like to hear your opinion if you see it the same way and what could be the causes. And the trend I, I hear is uh, that we have on the company level and individuals level increasing expectations to be taken care of uh, by the state or the central banks. And uh, I see this kind of notion even from the caregivers like the state and the central banks uh, as you noted, decreasing interest rate, uh, the like printing more money to put, to put it simply, and I wish to like hear your confirmation if you see this trend of the increase, and maybe in that sense you may look today like an old schooler confirming that there needs to be some kind of cleaning and some companies can bankrupt because the example of this trend may be that. Uh, then some companies bankrupt in the time of crisis. It's something we want to avoid, and let's say in all the times it was something being seen as a positive. So I would like to see if, uh, here if you see this trend, and I would like to hear your opinion what can be the cause. Probably we can see that, I mean, uh, at least from, from the data, how state budget is uh, developing and how a huge amount of money is now spread it into the companies and, and households. But on the other hand, I would not be too much negative in the way that saying that this is some new norm, a new standard, and everybody now is demanding, just, just give me. I think that we are in some huge structural break after pandemic. Yeah, when we realized that the situation during the pandemic was absolutely new for most of the society, Nobody knew what can bring, and the situation when you are closing part of the economy is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, so I still hope that we are in some special period which is still related to the pandemic of the COVID and how we 
need to solve the situation and unfortunately it switched switch to the Ukraine war and uh, crazy situation on the energy market. And I, I want to hope, and I do not have any evidence, this is maybe for some so sociologists asking people whether they are really now more demanding on, on government support, but I still hope that this is some kind of really temporary situation still related to the post-pandemic development and it will die out sooner or later, yeah. hopefully. Thank you very much for your time, for your patience and for your knowledge, of course. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jakub Seidler. Thank you very much. The second keynote speaker arrived from the Metropolitan University in Oslo and she will share her experience on the matter of sustainable business models and innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Tale Scholzwin. Thank you so much for the invitation. Great to come here. There are many challenges ahead of us, especially also related to our economy. I wanted to talk to, uh, to you about another challenge related to sustainability. I think all of you kind of recognize this picture. And we've been talking a little about, you know, Fed and the people think it's a delivery service. And if we go to the US, we find that 50% of waste is put in landfill. It's not recycled, it's just put somewhere to stay there to kind of get decomposed. And I don't think that's really sustainable. Because we, we are lacking a lot of different resources that we need going forward, especially within the digitalization. I'm gonna get, get back to that. But resources that we need to actually develop and, and build computers, so they can do some of the work that's needed to enable more sustainability to happen. So that's not sustainable and also 85% of plastic in the US is also put to landfill, 85% of plastic. I was in the US in Stanford in 2019 and there was this big discussion about straws. They have just decided that straws could not be in plastic. Okay, so you go into a food uh, court and you're buying something and you get a glass or a cup, the cup is in plastic the lid is in plastic, but the straw is in paper. And that was a big revolt, you know. So you leave the place with a big, huge pile of plastic, but they're discussing that actually now they made the straw into paper. I don't think we're getting very far very quickly. Okay, so we're gonna discuss this a little bit, but I wanted to start off with uh, a quiz. Yeah. So you need uh, might not be really sustainable, but I hope you still have some paper. This yes? This is a backup. Oh, this is a backup. This is the real one. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, so you're going to get a task. We've been doing a lot of statistics and math, so this will be a math task. Are you ready for a math task? You don't seem too happy about that. <laughs> no? You, you, we're now going to have a math task. You all ready? You have 20 seconds. There's another rule to this task that I didn't put on the slide, and it's you're not allowed to lift up your pencil. Okay, so you're not allowed to lift up your pencil. Can you remember that? You ready? This is your task. Can you join all nine dots with four straight lines in 20 seconds? You're not allowed to lift up the pencil from the paper. Everybody's looking at the board. No, n n who has paper? Anybody? No. I have a paper, but I don't have a pen. <laughs> okay. Okay, you still have 15 more seconds. Do we have a pen? Do we have a pen for the board? No. Okay. A 
OK, anybody got ideas? Yes, great. I wish I had a pen here. I don't. Did you want to come with an idea? Yeah, yeah. Or if we don't have, we don't. Oh, thank you. Everybody's thinking, how can I join these dots while kind of going within this square, right? The point is that you need to go outside the metrics. So you need to continue the line outside of the metrics. Do you know, what do you think this has got to do with innovation? Yes, thank you. Out of the box thinking. OK, so this is something that we need to do. Let's start by thinking about what innovation is. And I want you to discuss with your neighbor, what is innovation? Because we talk a lot about it, and we don't kind of define it. So grab one of your colleagues on the side and talk to them a little bit. What is innovation? OK, two minutes. OK, so can I get some input from the audience? What is innovation? Any ideas? What were you discussing? Nothing. <laughs> yes, some of you. What is innovation? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. You're, you're eager. You can, you can start it. I can, I can see it in you. <laughs> she, she's not part of life. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is whatever is better, better, or better, or even better if you know how it is better. Right. right. Might, Might not know, know later, later, right? right. Just, okay. okay. Something, Something that's better. better. Anyone else? Yes. More effective. More effective. Better. More effective. Okay. Great. Upgraded version of the previous system. Or Upgraded version. Okay. Yeah. Does it have to be in the same, like if it's different context, but it's upgraded for those who get it, is it still an innovation? Uh, in a way, yeah. yeah, so it doesn't have to be new to everybody. It could be new to in the context. OK. Other things? So we are upgraded, more efficient, more ideas? Yeah. Well, it can be disruptive. It can, be, it can have the same performance. It doesn't have to be more efficient no. or more effective. But it's a different way. model, yeah. a different way to do it yeah. that gains market. Okay, so it's a different way to do it. We do it with different process. Okay. Other ideas or thoughts? Okay, let's think a little bit about it. I kind of looking through a lot and lot of different definitions of uh, sustainability. No, I mean of innovation. I found that it could be maybe useful to think about along three different lines of thinking. So you see her dot dot Tala's attempt to translate because it was from Norwegian. So, so it's unique, unique in some sense, but doesn't have to be unique for everybody, but it has to be unique for in the context it is. It has to be useful, so efficiency and better, so it needs to be better. But it also, in, you know, in comparison to an invention, it has to be utilized in some sense. So it has to be used for something. So if you're just inventing stuff, you might call it an innovation, okay? So let's move on to the next question. What is a sustainable innovation? What does that mean? One minute to discuss with your neighbor. What is a sustainable innovation? What does that mean? <laughs> it's, if you're Googling, you're not kind of, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, sustainable innovation. First of all, I forgot something. Uh, you should also introduce yourself to your neighbor if you didn't do that already. Okay, so you, you have 30 seconds for all of you to just in, introduce yourselves because you didn't do that, because that's important as well. Okay, so now we're done with the formalities. And we go back to sustainable innovation. Ideas about what sustainable innovation is. Yes, thank you. Okay, we need to, we need for him to, yeah, please. As it is just uh, like a photo, when you enlarge your photo, like I mean, to reduce, it's all so clear, not just like, oh, we can't see anything already, all right, so keep the photo always clear. Okay. Just, so. just make your three years continue and make, make something new and different. I think uh, this is my idea. Okay, great, great. Thank you. So make it more clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Other ideas about sustainable innovation? You're very eager. I can see you. No. <laughs> hey, I'll, do you want to say something? It could be reducing food waste, for example. It could do re reducing food waste. Or taking care of resources. Taking care of resources. It brings long-term benefits. It brings more, more. Long -term. longer term. Okay, longer term benefits. There's some timeline there, okay? Sustainable over time. Great. Other things? Innovation that uh, helps people, that works for people. Yeah. Makes the life better. Makes the li yes, makes the life better for people. Okay, so there's something more than just an economic like output. Like usually when we talk about value creation from innovation, it's about the economic output that we were talking a lot about earlier. But there are other things with sustainability, like people well-being of people, could be environment, could be other kinds of outcomes than what we're used to when we think about innovation in a more traditional sense, right? Okay, so let's look at some definitions of this concept. So we have, there's not an established concept of sustainable innovation. So we are so fortunate that Ushla Mehta have started this doctoral program called sustainability, no, What's it called? It's like Innovation for Sustainability. So it's a PhD program. It's a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary program where you don't have a specific discipline. You're just more about solving those challenges, those huge challenges that are related to sustainability in an economic sense, an environmental sense, and a people sense, social sense. So we could say that it's the development of new products, processes, services, and technologies that contribute to the development and well-being of humans and institutions while respecting natural resources and regeneration capacities. So it's, mo it's not only about the economics. And I think, you know, before we're looking a lot, about, a lot on the economic dimensions of our society, this is about other dimensions. So renewal or improvement of product, services, techno technological or organizational processes uh, that not only deliver an improved economic performance, but also an enhanced environmental and social performance, both in the short and long term. I, some of you were thinking about the term. So this is more what we're concerned with when we're thinking about sustainability. So maybe we could revisit the previous figure and think about, you know, if it's going to be sustainable, we can only, we can not only think about the economic, we need to think about the social and the environmental as well. And there's something about the timeline. Usually when I talk about sustainability, we are challenged by very specific and difficult problems. So I've been teaching a lot and talking a lot about digital transformation, which is pretty short term and it's pretty visible what the problem might be, and it's also close to us in geography. geography. But when we're thinking about sustainable sustainability problems, they might be really far away in time, and they're usually far away in geography. And that makes it really difficult for people to change. 
because the imminence and urgency to change is not really present. Do you see it? So in terms of, we've been talking a lot about how to engage people in digital transformation, engaging people in sustainability issues is even harder. Okay, so let's dwell a little bit about, you know, with this sustainable innovation concept. Sustainability has two kind of ways that we can think about it. Either we can think about it as an outcome. We do innovation for a particular outcome that something is more sustainable. Alternatively, we can think about sustainable innovation as a value set. Like, this is who I am. When I think about something, my value set says that I'm not only going to be about profits. Do you see the difference in companies? Some companies, I'm going to have some examples later, but they're kind of taking this literally. If they don't take it seriously, we'll start to talk about greenwashing. Do anybody know what greenwashing is? Can you share with us what greenwashing is? It, there is nothing to tell no. what to do, or they just present it, or they, I have a nice example, uh, in the uh, power plant, uh, they present that they have got to NAS for Falco, it's nice, but each day they use 48 uh, wagons of coal. Yeah. Right, right. So. so they're kind of portraying it, so you, you know, I'm from Norway, we have Equinur, right, big oil and gas company, but they're trying to portray themselves as green. But when you look at their size of the business, it's super small, right? Okay, so, so this is like greenwashing, and you don't want that. And, and the other thing that's really important to think about is that it's not about a technical solution to do sustainable innovation. It's just as much a social uh, thing. We need to think differently about things that we do. So you cannot kind of, Solving these huge problems usually does not only involve a technical solution. So moving from this kind of notion of sustainability as a technical problem that we can solve towards you know, a social, integrated, value-oriented thing that we need to think about as people, that's really hard for society to transition. And also, a lot of companies try to do something that's kind of, they do something out there, but their core business is still the same. It's when you start to integrate that into your core business that you're actually kind of moving on towards more sustainable innovation. So companies usually go through these different types of stages of working on sustainable innovation. They start, you know, now in EU, there's this new uh, regulation coming that's telling us that we need to map everything that we do and we need to report on the economic, on the social, and on the, um, economic, uh, on the environmental side, right? So that engages companies in kind of seeing this as not only a challenge, but as an opportunity. That's like the first step. Something is put upon them, they need to start doing something, right? So they start by doing that. The next phase is making it part of their value chain. I think we were talking about kind of the economic side of value chains earlier and saying, you know, there are many different challenges related to the inflation of different raw materials, etc., and access to value change, chains. But when companies move on to the next level of sustainability, they actually take it into their value chains. And then at an even further level, they move up and start integrating it into how they think, how, how they develop and design products and services, how they develop new business models. And at the end, they kind of start thinking about the ecosystems of their companies and how they need to work with other organizations to make this happen. So this is kind of a little bit about the process of what kind of companies go through in their search and development of sustainable innovation. So it's not about, what, it's not about produ products. It could be about processes, services, and technologies. Okay. So let's talk a little about, bit about the circular economy, which now is a big part of what we think about as sustainability. So we could think about the linear economy, that's about to take something, a resource, make something, and use something. This is not a circular way of thinking about the economy. So if we want to move away from this, we need to think circular. So circular means that we try to, you know, Either we reuse, repair, remanufacture, we might take back goods, we might recycle and actually extract the resources from the goods that we are 
producing. And that is not easy because it demands a lot of challenges. I've been doing some podcasts in the building industry and you know, taking buildings and resembling them, that's really hard. So there's a lot of things and thoughts that needs to go into doing this. And often it's not about, you cannot only do it afterwards, you need to think about when you're developing your product. And why do we need to do this? Like I was, was talking about earlier, there's not enough you know, there's not enough resources if we're going to become sustainable. So let's talk a little bit about some business models before I finish off. So business models might be defined as, uh, you know, uh, how you c uh, combine different types of resources and activities um, in a system centered around the firm, uh, you know, taking into consideration both the internal and external boundaries of the firm, and it's about the value creation of the company, and it's about the value capturing of the company. So these are, this is usually one way to define it. The other way is to define it through using a business model canvas uh, where we kind of put up what is this organization consist of, what is the business model of the organization. So we can think about how can we change these things to things more sustainable. And I have with me some examples from Norway of companies that have tried to think differently about these things. So first of all, we have two really known companies in Norway called Finn and Tumra. And Finn is a platform. And Finn, what they do is they try to develop a second-hand market. I don't know if you have any of these platforms in Czech. It's, it's like you, have, you could have a cradle and you want to sell it and somebody wants to buy it. What is it called? Do you have one of these platforms? What could be? Fintash. Fintash. Okay, so that's the platform. Okay, so what do you? What, what can you put on there? Right. So it's like a digital solution that enables these exchanges of goods. So it's like second-hand market. That's one way. So Fin does a lot of that. They do it in Norway. They do it a lot of other places in Nordic. We have Tumra. They do recycling. Do you? Do you? Do you give your bottles back when you have? You know, take drink, you give it back to a machine in the, in the shop. Okay, they develop these glass one, but you don't get any money when you hand the bottles back. We do in Norway. We get a couple of kroners, so it might be four, four Czech kroners, back when you hand it in. So it's like a recycling system. They develop the, the machines for this. And now they've moved into a lot of different recycling. And they've also moved into, for example, mining, because they think that it's important that we you know, think about how we extract and use resources. So those are two key examples that's very well-known companies in Norway. We have some companies that are a little bit less known. This is Veas. It's a sewage sewer company. So they kind of clean, when you go to the toilet, they clean whatever is coming out of you with the water. OK, so I had this great opportunity to join the CEO of this company for a presentation. And she had the vision that it, you should get paid every time you flush the toilet. Why do you think you should get paid every time you flush the toilet? You're, you're, you're doing good. It's like potty training. No, that is not the reason. OK, why? Because there's lots of resources, right? Yep. Lots of resources in there. So when you flush the toilet, there are actually resources coming out of you that could be reused for something else. That makes you think a little bit differently about what you're doing right in the restroom, like creating resources right now this minute, OK? Uh, we have Badigons, which is another Norwegian company. They do a lot of different things in the business model. One of the things you saw in the business model is like, what is the payment model for your, what you're doing? Like, how do, do they pay you? That is one thing that's important with a business model. Do you rent something or do you sell something, right? So what they do is they create a lot of different outdoor clothes and they're really high quality and pretty expensive. So what they've decided to do is like they rent out these outdoor um, dresses for the kids rather than selling them because kids usually use them for maybe one year, right? So instead of selling them, you know, and then they just throw it away, let's just rent them out and somebody else can use them later. And they also do a lot of things with, they go on something called Tour the Sioux, 
which is like a tour. They go around Laura and help people repair their garments so they can keep them longer. So this is not, it doesn't seem like something that would be give profit right away, but based on the value set of the company, that is also important for them. Okay, and then we have something called Tarn, which is one of Finn's, or one of Shipstead who owns Finn, also owns Tarn. And Tarn is a place where they take a lot of things for the building industry that's not sold through regular channels, and they put it on the platform kind of to make sure that people can buy it so we don't throw it away. And then there's Oguri. And right now, the minister of, um, what could be that minister of economic, maybe, uh, business in, in Norway, uh, he, he is actually, he is part of a company called Vestre. So his name is Vestre. And they also have this uh, Uguri furniture. So the Uguri furniture is made out of plastic that comes out of the ocean. They make, plast they made, make furniture out of it. And then they put this furniture out in different types of public spaces. But the municipalities rent these furnitures. So they in kind of, both the input is sustainable, the furniture is supposed to be sustainable and in places where people can enjoy nature, and they have a rent model so that the furniture can be used again. So they're thinking along a lot of different dimensions in terms of sustainability. So these were just some examples from Norway in terms of developing sustainable innovation, sustainable business models. So let's just finish off with just talking a little bit about what can be strategies for developing circular business models. So I think I've given examples already, but there could be three main strategies. So first of all, you know, you could retain product ownership through different type of payment models. So for example, subscription or, or renting, or there are different ways of thinking about it rather than just selling the product for use, you retain it and make sure it's used, but that is also reused. So another, uh, you know, another one is to, pro to do product life extension like Barigans. They don't want the, you know, the consumer just to throw the clothes away afterwards. They want them to kind of keep them for a longer time so that they can be used more. And then it's you know, the question about how can we monetize on that and develop business models from that. And then the last one is that you actually take you know, the whole, your whole process really seriously and think about how can we design for recycling so that we can you know, think about the way we make the product, for example, in the building industry, making sure that we don't mix different types of substances because that makes it really hard to bring them apart afterwards. And then I thought this kind of distinction between low embedded value and high embedded value was kind of interesting. So they put this access in this Harvard Business Review uh, paper, which I thought was really uh, it's insightful. You know, it's difficult. Some of, some of these things are really difficult to access, uh, and some might be easy to access. So that depends a little bit on you know, your, your ability to recycle. The other is, is this an easy process of accessing or a hard process of accessing? So you can kind of get different types of squares in there. And then it's also about what type of value is embedded actually in these products. So for example, for rubber on the, on the, or for Michelin on the top right, rubber is not a really valuable material afterwards. So you know, doing a lot of recycling, it's really important for environment, but it's really hard to develop business models from that because it's not really valuable. But you might have, for some electronics maybe, you're really keen on getting copper out, copper out, then it might be really valuable to actually do the recycling. So there are different types of dimensions to think about with these different strategies for developing circular business models. So, but most of all, I would like to urge you to think a little bit outside of the box in this area. And that was what I had. Thank you. I love questions. My question is, um, you talk a lot about the business models and about the companies. And could you please uh, to give, if it is possible, of course, if, it's, if it is included in your research, uh, some example of uh, government regulations, maybe tax regulation or financial regulation, that uh, there is more 
efficient in Norway, for example, if it is possible, of course. Sure. So, 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 I, so it's really hard for me because I don't know what is in Czech, so I'll just try to give some knowledge. But I think we're all, I think all of us are under this new regulation of before, you know, you, bigger companies had to report on sustainability uh, in terms of these different three dimensions, social, environmental, and economic. Uh, so that's common. But what's coming now is also for small and medium sized companies. They also need to report on this. And they start a lot with the greenwashing, like we were talking about earlier. But maybe that kind of spirals an initiative to see it more as an opportunity rather than like a liability that they need to do this reporting. Maybe it can make us think about you know, um, how and, and why we should be doing this. In terms of tax regulations in Norway, I'm not really sure about if we have any special tax regulations. They might have on the municipal level different types of you know, ways of making incentives for people to engage or companies to engage in sustainable solutions. But I don't think there's like a fixed, uh, you know, special taxing of the, you know, there are, there are CO2, like CO2 quotas that, you know, you have when you're a bigger company, but on a, a small, and there are of course people who follow and see that you're not, you know, putting a lot of things into the environment from your production, but that's why they want the reporting because they want to have a numbers and access to an understanding of the degree to which this is happening. Yeah. Uh, so in the maritime industry, in Norway, yep. you have the NOS uh, grants. Okay. The, the ships, ship owners get. Okay. The Which they keep, keep low emissions. Yeah, yeah. But I've heard about a lot of different things that uh, companies do that are kind of cool. Like they might game if, you know, uh, for emissions, for example, in this one trucking company, they do gamification. So the trucking drivers, I know they're playing a game while they're driving to try to do as low emissions as possible and to drive as fuel efficient as possible. So it becomes like a game for them because it doesn't really matter as a truck driver for your salary if you're very efficient or not. But when you're kind of gaming with others, it becomes like a game and you think it's fun as well. So that might be different types of incentives, but that's more on a company level than on a national level. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And there was a strong contrast because uh, if I ask uh, some some uh, uh, some people uh, about this topic, they said on a uh, personal level, individually, for them it's very important. Right. Yeah? They think about that and so on. Right. And when I ask uh, what about the company that right. are working, uh, oh, okay, uh, they think about that, but uh, we have much more important things. There are other priorities. We uh, have to care about the profit, we have to care about the inflation, we have to care about the crisis. Right. So it's not uh, so important on the company level. So how to change its meaning? Uh, yeah. On the individual level, I think we are in the process of changing, especially for a uh, young generation. They, uh, for them, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. But on the business level, uh, it's a little bit worse. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a super important question. And I think it's really interesting to look at the visions and missions of companies. I think that continuously more companies see that this is important, not maybe for the short-term profit, but for actually gaining employees and their desires to want to work in the company. Because young people, increasingly more young people, want this kind of to be part of a mission and something that means something more than just making profit. So when I went out of business school when I was young, I started working at Bain & Company. And it was OK to say to people that, what do you do when they ask you what do you do? And it's like, I help big companies make more money. Today, that is not, at least in Norway, it's not like it's not socially acceptable, which I think is fine. So that's why I'm also kind of trying to tell the story. It's not only about the goals. It, it's also about the values of the companies and what they actually want to achieve. And I've heard talks about, you know, what is the role of organizations? It's because public sector has a big role, and we, we as individuals feel that role. But we actually need to think a lot about what the role of the organizations in society is in this because they have a huge and really important role. And I think as consumers and employees, we are in a good position to try to affect this. And that's why it's not about just the environment and the social, it's also about the econom economics. So it's like these three dimensions because we all know that if it's not economically sustainable, it's not going to be sustainable. So we as consumers need to kind of 
ask for these products, ask for these things if we really want this to happen. And I think we understand that we need this to happen. So I think it's a really good question. Yeah. Thank you. Next question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, please pass the microphone to the colleague right in the middle. And just going to research, we also need a lot of researchers to actually tackle this topic. That's why we also started this new PhD, to be challenge driven rather than discipline driven, which we usually are as researchers. Just a comment, yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe we are playing with the sustainability in Europe, in America, in Japan. Right. How can we, I don't like the word export this, to the third countries? Yes. And if we are speaking uh, in general, <coughs> worldwide, Yes, I have a PhD that's kind of working on this. I know there are research being done, but I think it's an important point because it's especially important because that's kind of who we are exploiting, right? So they are the they often feel it, and we're we're not taking our responsibility. Especially as a Norwegian, I really feel that kind of burning on my shoulders. But I think knowledge, uh, you know, export in this area is really important to talk about these things. But they might not be in the position, like might not have the right power to actually have the influence, but they are more the victims of some of these kind of structures. So, yeah. If I can continue, or is there any other question? So as, a, as an example, a company or a brand, do they wear Nike, for example? Okay, maybe they are sustainable in the terms of their shoes last right, longer yeah. than usually. Yes. But the sustainability should be as well social, as you said. Yeah. yeah. And their factories in the third countries right. and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely. It's about all of the children's yeah. work and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so they're just picking up. So actually, this, you know, it's like, uh, you can say that a lot. You know, like, you know, like for, for the, the tire time. producers. Like, totally not good for the environment. But they are at least, like, the journey is starting. I think it's important also not to judge too much. If, if companies start to do things, it's better than them doing nothing in a way, in my mind, even though they still have a lot of issues that need to be solved and actually in a really you know, un, uh, unenvironmentally friendly business. But we need this transition, and some nudging is better than you know, uh, non nudging. Is, Anes, are you still here? No, I think he stepped out from it. So one of my colleagues is here, and he's working on how to make uh, you know, IT systems much more energy efficient, but also because also the IT industry is a huge polluter in the sense of using energy and uh, uh, f using energy. OK. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. And maybe for your answer. Good afternoon, Ms. Dara Shosui. Thank you. Thank you. and co-founding member of several biotechnological spin-offs such as uh, Macromo or Gene Spectre. And so please welcome Mr. Michal Pohlutka. not so easy. And today I'm going to share how to run. And I am going to share three stories today. And any of them, of course, any of them is unique. Three real companies, the first and second one is a university spin-off of Charles University. And the last one is a regular startup. So the first one, the first story started in 2020 with a pandemic and everything changed. In hospitals or in laboratories, at least here in the Czech Republic, everything was missing. All the chemicals, instruments and, hello, instruments and even the experience. Just imagine with the PCR testing in one lab, for example, here in faculty hospital, there were performed just 10 or 15 tests per week. And then there was a request to measure 1,000 samples per day. And this, it was really challenging for everybody here in the hospitals, not only in the Czech Republic. 
And that was the reason why Gene Spector was founded, to create Czech local company providing all the chemicals necessary for PCR testing here in the Czech Republic. It's almost three years Gene Spector is in the market. In, it finished actually with COVID-19 pandemic, and these are the results from the company. In the turnover, we have 20 million US dollar in the first two years. We help around 20 laboratories or 20 hospitals here in the Czech Republic. We perform over 5 million tests. And we provided half a million US dollars for charity here in the Czech Republic. We sent back to university over 2 million US dollars to Charles University. And we work as a spin-off company with zero employees. Gene Spector consists of four companies, mother companies, and we use all the operation, all the sales, all the support, logistics, finance, and any single function of the company from the mother companies. And we had a lot of difficulties from the beginning, actually, to the end with this setting, because you cannot manage people while they are not employer, employees. We had difficulties with deliveries as uh, everybody across Europe. We were buying chemicals from UK, Germany. We were buying instruments from Africa, for example. And we didn't get money from hospitals because they are not paying immediately. So we were in minus 64 million check rounds in the first four months. We had as well a couple of nice, I would say, activities or moments. We spent Christmas in hospitals. We met prime minister and I wrote a book just to remember what happened if I'm gonna be old guy. The second story we know what's innovation right now. Gene Spector Innovation is the second startup of Charles University. And actually, it's the same group of people. The, the biggest benefit from Gene Spector is the team behind. Those people are people from Charles University, from First Faculty of Medicine mainly, from routine laboratories in hospitals. And those people are having the motivation to change the life of many people across the globe. So this is a global project and how we are working and how we'd like to change the life of people. We are creating new innovative technologies in clinical diagnostics. And I know it's quite far from you because you have more economical background. So what we are doing. I'm going to introduce three technologies from the company. The first one is just imagine that there is a pregnant lady and we are able to say from the, just from the blood from week nine to 10 that the lady is going to have pregnancy complication a lot like diabetes, like high pressure, preterm birth and others just from blood. Over 7% in the globe are having kidney disease. It's a huge number. Some of them uh, never happened during the life, but some of them are ending with dialysis or even in transplantation of kidney. Now, uh, in cooperation with Boston, uh, we discovered a new molecule and we have an approach how again just from blood to say that the person is going to have difficulties with kidney in years ahead. And the last one is it, it's related to COVID-19. During the pandemic everybody was saying that old people are under threat, right? But we are able to say just from one reaction 
that the person is going to have difficulties in a couple of days. A couple of days ahead, we can say that the person is going to have difficulties and will stay in hospitals with any respiratory disease. So this is what we are doing. We are creating new technologies that are patented. It's coming mainly from Charles University and the business model is completely different than, than to create biotechnological company. We are just creating technology for exit and in cooperation with global partners, we are delivering the technologies to the global market. The first one, we are now under discussion with the number two in the globe to incorporate this technology into the portfolio they have and it's regulated market, so we are not doing the certifications, it's quite difficult. So again, the business model is to create technologies and in cooperation with global partner to deliver to any single laboratory in the world. But what we know is that we are doing B2B business. We are creating technologies to laboratories, hospitals, and therefore, we are not too much in touch with people. And I'm going <coughs> to talk about Macromo. It's the last story. It's a regular startup with three young people shortly over 20 years. And what we would like to create is personalized preventive healthcare in the pocket, just in the mobile application. And why we do so? People are more and more serious about their health. They know it's very costly later on, and people like to stay healthy longer, right? And therefore, they invest a lot of money into fitness, into nutrition, and many other, many other activities. I don't know how many of you is having some variable and are tracking plenty of parameters. And I don't know how many of you know what it means. The biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges, is that we have all the data, but we don't know what the data mean. For example, with the variables. Then you go for the blood test, and you have hundreds of parameters, and you don't know what it means. Then you go to hospital for operation, surgery, for whatever, and all the paper stays in the hospital. And you have plenty of resources about you, but you have no control what you would like to do for your health. And therefore, we are creating AI-driven application to combine all the data together and provide people recommendations how to live and how to do medical tests that are personalized to anybody of you. And for me, it's going to be different, for example, than for you. So, we are cre creating a global product. We go to precise medicine. We work with big data and it's data-driven platform. And we combine data from laboratories as well from variables. And I'm going to talk about, I will come back then, this one. Because as you are not from the segment of healthcare, we start with DNA testing. It's very simple. It's coming from saliva. And from saliva by NGS, we are able to say the predispositions for many diseases you have because it comes from the history, family history. And now we have the technologies to uncover the threads you can have in your life. Why it's important? It, it doesn't say that you are gonna die for something. It just, say, it just said that you have the threat somewhere and you can be focused on just a couple of diseases more frequently from the preventive by medical check or blood tests or even with the variables. And once you have it, you can get personalized preventive healthcare program that might be specialized blood tests for everybody and medical checks. So what we are doing, we are connecting the data and we are providing people the recommendations what to do. And then I'm going back. We put everything into one application. So it means that all data is in one application. 
If you go for the blood test, for example, it means that you have one parameter. So what is very important for any blood test parameters is how it behaves during the time. For example, with diabetes. It doesn't mean that once you have glucose or any other parameter connected to diabetes a little bit higher or longer, it doesn't mean an issue. But once you have it, the curve in the line and in the time, then you can see the trend and you can see that the diabetes is starting approaching to your life, for example. And then the treatment is much more effective than if you can catch it at the end. So what we are doing, we are connecting predispositions, lifestyle, environment, and we put it all together with a goal to provide people recommendations how to live, I don't know, on a weekly basis in terms of sport, lifestyle, and personalized medical checks. And as I said, we go as a regular startup, so now we are burning more money than earning more money. Uh, we go to series A, B, C, and we are building the platform. Later on, we would like to connect the platform with the insurance companies, with the pharma companies for drug development and plenty of other options we have there. And at the end, we would like to build the platform that is open for any other party with like as well insurance companies and going data there and back with the goal to have your personal data connected to your health under your control. And as I said, behind this project there are just young people thinking a little bit differently. Peter is 22 years old, having uh, three successful startups in history, in his life. Eva has been working for a couple of companies in Silicon Valley for uh, creating applications. Uh, Adam is doing marketing and myself. So with these three stories, I just wanted to introduce the projects and companies I work on and to show that even it can be difficult, it would make sense to start and to work on that if you believe in what you are doing and you love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, now it is time for the audience to ask questions. Well, to ease the shyness of the audience, I have to confirm that uh, Macromo company works and it is much less abstract than it seems. It was, let's say, original gift for my wife. So, Hellas Economic, uh, Economic Days really provide an inspiration for many parts of your life. And it is really just a small box that will provide you a guide how to do your DNA test and then everything is in your mobile app. So please don't be shy and ask for this uh, wonderful opportunity to see something that might be in the next decade and more. <laughs> I would like to ask you how much expensive was the development of this platform, Macromo, How much expensive is to, to create a platform? platform? Yes. Till now it's about 5 million check rounds. Now we are entering a uh, seed round uh, to raise 1 million euro uh, to finish the design of the platform and the application and to do the deep tech behind because it's not about the application, it's mainly about to do the algorithms and evaluation on the data and, and connect the data from DNA with the blood testing and medical check and variables. And it's quite costly and, and uh, we are targeting now 1 million euro in the seed round.
and when one project is submitted by 7 million euro, Mm-hmm. Yeah, till now we, we don't have any investors behind, it's um, more driven by angels. Thank you. The next question. Thank you for a great presentation. I admire your willingness to undertake some of the biggest technology companies in the world, especially Apple, maybe. So how are you thinking about that? Can you get access to the data that Apple has on their, like their clocks? And can you, like, how can you do that? Second question, because I know that Estonia has been mapping their whole population with their DNA. I don't know, are you pushing, uh, you know, governments of the uh, Czech Republic to kind of try and think about the same to enable it? more easy for you company to do these things? So two questions. First one is, uh, yeah, we are connected to Apple already, so we can uh, we can take all the data from the variables and evaluate the data. Uh, it's done by our engineers, and there's a protocol to manage that. Okay. And the challenge is not to get the data. The Ch challenge because, because they just provide a list of parameters they measure, and anybody know, doesn't know what it means. So what we are now doing is to transform the data to some platform that's understandable for everybody and at the end to provide the recommendations how to increase, decrease con that's connected to actually DNA results. You know, because for me, it would be 10,000 steps okay, for example, because I'm okay with the legs and, and the, the platform and metabolism. But for anyone else, it could be maybe too much because of bones. And then after, it, it's like with the running, where the people having 50, they recognize they should start running. And in 52, they are going for, for operation with knees because they don't have the construction for the running. And it's the same, everybody is unique. So we are more now thinking about how to change the data from the Apple because we can manage to get it and to get it personalized for everyone. We are in the face. The second question is, Qatar is very strong. Estonia is strong, Qatar is very strong. Here in the Czech Republic, we are more, I would say, talkative <laughs> about a topic. I, I don't think it's gonna happen in a couple of years. So therefore, it's coming more from the innovative companies. It's bottom up model rather than opposite. Yeah. Next question for and then the guy in the back. Hello. You said that uh, your program is very costly, and uh, I'm interested in whether uh, you have already considered crowdfunding as a source of financing of your business, because a lot of people might be interested in their health and in the future, and they uh, can think it's, it's cool, and they can give you money and uh, want nothing back. It's a good question. We are considering this way of raising money. money. Uh, and in the second phase. Because in the first phase, we'd like to, I, I would say, take the option to have angels on board because they can be as well active investors like people from laboratories or business that could help us directly with some activities within the company. But it's a good option, absolutely. The, the challenge with, uh, the, with this rising is that we are thinking more global. So it's, I would say, more, more local solution and short term. So what's more important for us to get a partner with, with uh, I would say, higher amount of money to provide us the option to go to Europe and then to US and to explore the application across the world. Uh, so we are just a couple of people on board and we spend the energy more looking for the partner that could help us to deliver the global product rather than to sell a couple of tests here locally. And it's a good question. Uh, I just look. I just had a look at this uh, application, and my question is that 
there is any great, uh, very great debate for a certain population. For example, we, we, are, we live in Spain, uh, in Spain and we are over eight, uh, eight, 18 customs and, uh, and, uh, and live, live in habit totally different for, uh, uh, among the others. So I think sometimes uh, even the genetic material is totally different. So I really want to know how to make sure that AI from this application will give us the best, uh, the best information of the best advice for us. This is my question. Thank you. It's a good one. It's a perfect one. Um, I will start from the different angle and I will come back to you. It's a data-driven platform. So if you have the origin out of Europe, during the evaluation of the data from the lab, we are combining the data set from actually your region, not from Europe. Uh, because if we use the data set uh, for European population, it might be different than for different region. Uh, so the results comes from data and there is no space for AI. The space for AI where we, where we would like to use the AI and the system is how to deliver the message. Because someone likes more reading. So, and we have actually the feedback from someone is very short and from uh, someone else, it's too long. And we would like to use the AI to provide the option and uh, I don't want to say just the length of the delivery or the message, but uh, in the communication to the people, not in the results, because the results is strictly done and it's deep tech and uh, it's not too much. Uh, for AI, it's really hard data, and we have to work with data set, and we have the algorithms behind, and actually that's the answer. And you are absolutely right, for you, it will be different data set than for me, for example. Thank you very much, and I can see uh, another question here. I am always worried about my personal data. Maybe you know the book by Robin Cook, Vrajetna Applica Secular App, I guess. Uh, how about this future? Like, what if an app decides that I am useless anymore <laughs> and suggests me of running something because it makes sense? Uh, the, the application is just a tool. tool. It's, it's not your life, first of all. <laughs> you decide yeah. about your life. About data security, we go with GDPR and all the regulations. It's regulated by MDR, so we go for MDR regulation. Uh, uh, so we are quite strict in that. Coming back to recommendations, it provides you recommendations uh, connected to your health profile. And if you follow them or not, we are not convincing the people. You have to know what you would like to do in your life. That's, that's the answer. But you are absolutely right. It's a tool. It's not your life. How much for the subscription for the monthly subscription? Zero. 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 So it's free for everybody. Nice. Uh, you have to buy the test on the eShop. So you are paying. At the, oh, I'm sorry. It's exactly. It's you, you, the, the, the entry point is the DNA test uh, is around 200 US dollars. But it's for whole life because the, the DNA, DNA never change. Or, or if you are an oncology patient, then it might change, but not uh, in a regular situation. DNA doesn't change over the year, year and years. So it's one test for whole life, and you pay it. Then the subscription is for free. The last question from the audience. Seems audience is already overwhelmed. So I would like to thank you for your presentation and wish you luck with all companies you mentioned today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michal Ohlutka. Thank you all for your attention and uh, for that you came here in minutes. We got lunch, and uh, the last thing I would like to invite you is an evening banquet where we could discuss what was not mentioned here. 
And thank you again. Have a nice rest of the conference.